Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm Arno uh, from ThinkCell, and I'll be talking about how we do range formatting, or how we do text formatting at ThinkCell. And we have a range library, so this could be potentially a way to do text formatting in a future range-based library. Now, of course, text formatting is everywhere and has been tried many times before, many different libraries, many different approaches. Here is yet another one. Of course, this one is very special because this is the very last one and the very best one, and I'm sure you guys know the XKCD comic, right? Okay, um, so what is, range, uh, what is text formatting? You have a bunch of components in, that you want to build a string off with their positions, and for some of these components, they may not already be strings, they may be data, and you have some parameters that control how they are converted into strings, and they're all being formatted, put together, and the output is a string. Okay, now, pretty simple. Um, we have to pick one of the possible syntaxes for building our library. Um, and one option that is popular, of course, are format strings. So printf has been doing it. Um, you have, you all know the percent notation. And uh, more modern libraries, for example, the upside library of Google, they also have format strings. And upside library actually uses the printf syntax, the percent syntax. And uh, there's also currently a for string formatting library that finds its way through the standard committee. So there is already something on its way um, to become a C++ standard, the P0645 paper. Um, it uses the Python syntax, and it, like, it seems like the Python syntax is, is becoming more and more popular. Now, that's one way to do it, uh, is format strings. There, we essentially assign a special meaning to the string literals. Now, what, can, what else can you do? Well, you can use not a format string, or just C++, I want to call it. The probably most well-known um, way to do it without format strings is are the I.O. streams. The standard way to do it since C++ 98 or something. Um, but I also want to include just plain vanilla string concatenation. That's also a way to, to format a string. Okay, um, let's go through the options and see what we want to pick. Now, let's go to the format string first. What's good about format strings? You have in the format string, you, you get a pretty good idea of what the final string looks like. So, um, there used to be the counter argument against format strings that they can't be validated, uh, that you cannot ensure that the actual percent thing that you have in your string matches the type. Well, that's no longer the case with uh, const expert strings. We can actually do compile time checking. And the more modern libraries, the upsell library and the, the formatting library, P0645, they're actually doing it. Um, of course, um, with the format strings, you have the option to actually pick it at runtime, and then you cannot do the validation. That's fine, I guess. That's to be expected. But I have a few pet peeves with format strings. Um, first of all, you have to escape your string. Okay, so far so good. Uh, you have to remember doing it. Hmm. We also kind of have a special language for describing the parameters. And we already have a language. There's already C++. Now you are putting that, that format notation into your literals, which is yet another language. It seems pretty straightforward to use C++ instead. Um, this is more problematic if you have user-defined types. Because if you are, many times you want to ad hoc format some object in your application, and if you want to control how it's being formatted through a format string, you have to parse that little string snippet that you have in your format string, which is a bit awkward. I mean, I just want to you know, do my work. I don't want to write parsers right now. Um, here's what I think is the biggest problem. Now, when you have a bunch of strings that you want to concatenate, it is very natural to just put one string after the other, right? You wouldn't write percent %s, percent %s, percent %s, percent %s, and then put all the strings there, and then you count that the number actually match. But what if you want to insert a single number in there? You want to format it a little bit. Hmm. This would either require to do some hybrid thing, you just have some, some string snippet in the middle that you format, and everything else isn't formatted, which is a 
bit weird. Or you make that non-incremental change of turning everything into a form string. And that's, that's my, my biggest problem. Um, and that, that what actually bugs us or bugged us uh, when we were using form strings. Now, there are one area where you really can't do without format strings. When you're translating a program, as you do with every bigger project, into different languages, you're probably not going to have the resources in house to do the translation. Usually, give this out to a translation agency, and you communicate with them using some form, form of um, XLIF, which is like the standard format that they use to, to um, basically you deliver the text to them. They give you the translation back, and of course, your text actually may contain placeholders. You may want to write something like this. And you have to pass it to them, and they have to get back to you. So there you must use format strings. But it turns out, in this case, it's actually not a terribly good idea to include all the formatting parameters into your format string. Because the, you basically only want the translation agency to mess with your code as much as needed, which is they, they can resort the order of parameters. This happens maybe in some languages, that's fine. But you don't want them to determine how your date is formatted or whether you use a comma or a period. You, you get that kind of control from elsewhere. You get it from the operating system settings. Or you maybe make up a database, a, a map, where you say, OK, if you have this language, we're going to use these parameters or these, these formats for, say, a date. Uh, you don't want that. Leave that to the translation agency. So really, to dumb down your format string, um, to just positional arguments is, is probably a good idea. Let's go to the other choice, no format strings. And the first one I'm talking about is I.O. streams. Of course, no one likes I.O. streams. They abuse the shift operator. Um, that's one thing, maybe that's excusable because they didn't have variadic templates, so that's okay. Um, but they also they, when, you, when you control the formatting, you have to insert these stateful manipulators. You have to say set precision something, and then you actually give it the data. OK, well, the problem is if you take that stream and then pass it around your program in function calls to, to successively, just incrementally add to that stream, you never know which state that thing is in. And either you have a really strong discipline of making sure that whenever you're passing it, it has the right state, or you have to re re reset the state all the time, which is also clumsy. Um, and, and also, they, they gave you this extra headache that set precision, for example, applies to all the formats or all the objects that comes afterwards. Set width doesn't. It forgets it right after it's been used once. It's, that's a big headache. I didn't like that. Um, it's also pretty slow because underneath that stream there is um, a, a buffer which is tied to that stream using uh, virtual functions. That's not great. And then at the very end, uh, the stream just holds the string in sort of some maybe some, some sequence of buffers. And if you want to string out of it a consecutive piece of memory, you have to copy everything again. So the, the string um, call will, will copy everything again. All not great. Let's go to the other option, string concatenation. OK, here we have a different abuse of operator overloading. I, I think uh, Bjorn just mentioned it in his talk. The, the plus is not really a plus. Um, you don't have any formatting options. Well, so C11 gave us these very simple two string functions, but they offer nothing in terms of parameterizing how you want that two string to be done. And they're also slow because they are generating first little strings. And then they copy the strings together. So you're generating, you're doing a lot of heap allocations. But I actually like the syntax of it. It's kind of the essence of formatting. You build little snippets, and then you put them together into your string. And these snippets may be formatted versions of your data. Using, doing user extension, which I think is very important, is very simple. You simply do a function call. It just puts together some substring. Right? And then you insert the substring into your bigger string. So what we will do is try to kind of stick to that syntax and try to overcome all the weaknesses with ranges. So we can actually program in that style. First of all, um, to see about ranges, um, who knows the range-based for loop? Everyone. Uh, who knows ranges TS? OK, fewer. Uh, Eric Niebler's library? Who 
uses ranges already every day. Oh my God, you should. You really should. Uh, so I'm not going to ask what you're using. Um, you, you really should consider using ranges. So here's the essence of it. Um, iterators come usually in pairs. You have a begin and an end. And there's no good reason why this begin and end are really two separate objects. You are just going to mess it up. So we want to put that into one object. That's, that's the goal. Um, so a range is going to be anything, any object that has a begin and an end where you can iterate over. So that may be containers as a single object, vectors or, or basic strings or whatever, um, but that also may be just pairs of iterators and they are now called views for ranges. Views because they're not owning their elements, they're just referencing them just like pairs of iterators did before. Ranges are a lot more interesting because they actually can do lazy calculations. That means when I'm calling in our library TC filter with range and a predicate, this captures the range and the predicate into an object, but it doesn't do anything with yet. It, it just captures the, the arguments. And only then when you're iterating over that object, then the filter will actually start, will, will skip the elements that don't satisfy the predicate. So you, you do the work as when you need it and as much as you need it. If you don't need the first element, then you're only going to do the work for the first element. Why do I think I know something about ranges? Um, we've been building a range library for a long time. Say, oh my god, 12 years, 13 years, something like that. And we have, along with that library, um, we have about one million lines of production code that use the library. And usually when you build a library, you have this chicken and egg problem. You have to learn, to learn a good design for your library, you have to use the library. Now, once you've got a lot of use for your library, then you can't change the library anymore because people are screaming when you change the library. You, you have that in the, with, the, with the standard library, you have that in, 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 large, in large scale, this problem. Um, we, can, we, are, we have the luxurious position to avoid it because whenever we, you change, we, we change our range library, we can actually change our production code with it. And we actually have someone just dedicated to refactoring code. So whenever we are changing the range library, as I have some new idea of how to do it better, then we're just going to change all our production code um, to reflect that new idea in the, in the range library. And I think that way, over time, we got a pretty good, mature library, and we have a lot of experience of what works and what doesn't. Now, when you're starting to use ranges for text, probably the first thing you want to do is you want to get rid of all these member function calls in, of basic string. So basic string is this shadow world where everyone is doing iterators in, except for basic string. They are doing indices and member functions. And the first thing we did was get rid of all that stuff. You want to have a uniform way of treating ranges. It doesn't really matter whether it's a character range or whether it's a range of numbers. You're using the same algorithms on either one. This also allows you um, quite frequently if you're interacting with some operating system, for example, if you do Windows on COM, it insists on a particular string type, say BSTR. Now, with ranges, you can now wrap that string type into a, an interface that is just a range interface, and you can again use the same algorithms that you want to use with everything else. C17 just introduced, introduced basic string view. Now, basic string view goes exactly the opposite direction, or at least parts of it. So you, the, the design goal of basic string view was be compatible with basic string. This thing must be a drop-in replacement for basic string. And now everyone says C++ is, is hard to teach. Well, basically, basic string view is fine. Just don't use all that member function stuff would be my advice. All right. Now, let's start doing some text formatting with ranges. Um, every range library has some sort of concatenation. So we'll just stick to that. So we have a concat in range v3, it's named the same. We, we kind of made the, made the names equal to, to minimize confusion. Um, and it's, it's just concatenating these two strings. And now, of course, you want to do some sort of formatting. So what do you do? Well, we just added a function that, or functions, that do the formatting. You give the data to it and some parameters, say here it's a double and you want two decimal digits, 
and it will return a range of characters that is that number formatted in the way you want it. So just to keep in mind, this is not like I.O. stream. You have to explicitly turn your data into strings because ranges can be anything. The ranges could also be a range of doubles. So you don't want to be confused about what type of range you currently have. So we, we make an explicit call to say, okay, this is no longer a double, this is now a range of characters. So they just putting an F in there won't compile. Uh, there's no need for a special format function. You just use concat. Extensing, uh, extending it with user-defined formats is trivial. You just write a function uh, that returns a range. And all the range algorithms still work. You can iterate over that stuff, you can call any algorithms, it all just works. Now, I was so far pretty shy about say, talking about the types that are being returned. It was kind of hand-waving. You, you write that expression and it somehow works. Eventually, you will want to put this stuff into a container. So how do we do that? Well, let's look what we already have from the standard library. Um, sit string with an empty constructor, of course, gives you an em empty string. And if you put on the right-hand side something that's literal or already a sit string um, or car pointer, and it will actually copy that car pointer. So the idea is kind of the right, as long as the right-hand side is something string-like, we'll construct a string from that. Well, let's stick to that. So we just say, okay, we just introduce uh, new constructors in this did string that on the right-hand side take anything character range-like. So we can stick an sdeck in there or the concat with multiple components. Both are character ranges and you construct a string from that. And I mark it up with suggested just to indicate that it does not compile. Um, what we did, and you, you may or may not like it, um, we added syntactic sugar so that you don't have to write the concat. If you just have a very added con constructor that takes multiple arguments, it's kind of implied that you're going to um, concatenate all the, all the uh, arguments. It's a kind of like a, like a linear extension of zero arguments is empty, one argument is that string, well, two arguments, well, it's that string one after the other. Now, what about existing constructors of std string? Right here I was pretty liberal and saying, oh, we have this two element constructor on a std string, um, I'm gonna use it again for something else. But we already have constructors. Let's see. Um, so what do they do? The first one is undefined behavior. Um, it, because it says, take the first three elements of the buffer, the A buffer, um, but the A buffer only has two elements, A and a null terminator. So that's undefined behavior buffer all right. Ah, this, actually, because I got the number of, uh, the, the order of arguments wrong, at 65 times control C. This may or may not be your con intent in this situation. Now, okay, this time, this thing adds three times the A. Okay, but to be honest, I mean, deprecate all that stuff. Um, you can describe what you want in your string in a much better way of, by defining a range and then copying that range into the string. Of course, we can't just go, or we did not just go through the standard library and just hack out all the constructors, right? I mean, not quite that brutal. So um, what we did in the library is we kind of invent, invented this explicit cast that is pretending as if we could influence what kind of explicit constructors a particular existing type has. So what we're really writing is something like explicit cast sit string and then whatever arguments you pass to sit string. What we also have is um, a wrapper for m place back because you, you wanna do something like this where you have a vector of strings and now you m place back a, a, a character range. And this you want, simply want to work. You want this to convert this to string and it gets pushed back onto the vector. So we wrapped m place back. And of course you also need an append. If you already have a string, you wanna append stuff, well, that's not too hard. Again, there's a variadic version uh, for multiple, for the automatic concat, basically. I also promised you format strings. Um, here's how our format strings look like. It also shows a little bit of syntax of how this thing actually looks like when you, when you put together um, a, a website, a, a web page, for example. Um, this is how it basically works. So um, 
the placeholder is just just takes positional arguments. Anything that you want to add in terms of parameters is goes to the end, where you are basically just sticking in string snippets. And if you want a string snippet building it out of a double, you just use your addStack function as usual. We also have named arguments. Um, sometimes, if you write a template and you are, you are basically your, your string doesn't come out of the does not come out of the code, but it comes from from file on the disk, you may want something that's a bit more descriptive in your uh, in your strings. And yeah, there is an ISO 8601 formatter there as well. So these kind of stuff um, we, we have in the library. Now, how would you implement that? Hmm. So um, an easy way to implement it would be that each formatter just returns a string and concat just concatenates strings and the append just um, appends strings. Hmm. Well, it's good because it's simple. It's not so good because, again, we need to allocate all these strings. So we don't want to do that. And also the talk would be over and we are still just 20 minutes into the talk. Okay, so how do we do it? Um, the first thing we want to do is we don't want to have any heap allocations for the individual components. Before, when, it, when we are actually allocating strings, we had to actually go to the heap for each and every string, potentially, and, uh, and that's quite costly, and so you don't want to do it. The thing is, as long as these SDEC like formatters actually create their character ranges lazy, um, they actually have a compile time determined size. So this basically looks like this. Um, you have a, an SDEC which stores just the F and the 2, and then the concat stores whatever components it has. And there we are actually a little bit different from range V3. Um, it proved to be a good idea to just say, okay, anything that is an L value is stored by reference, and anything that you pass in by R value is stored by, by a moving copy. Worked well for us, and we use it throughout the library. What you're getting is a little bit something like expression templates. You have basically built this big tree-like data structure, and when you then want to pass it into a string, or when you want to iterate over it, you execute that data structure, and it generates the character range. Okay, let's get that into containers. How, what's the perfect way to get stuff into the container? Well, you, you kind of know the size in advance, you allocate once, and then you write all the characters into the container. You can't really be any faster than that. So let's see how this goes. The first attempt is just use the container constructor with, for two iterators. So um, you have begin and end, and uh, do it like, like the, the, in, in the standard. Now, and, and I'm only showing here the explicit cast that is uh, for containers. There are other explicit casts, it's a general facility to replace constructors. Um, but for this talk, it's only gonna be about containers. Now the problem is, the formatters that we have, the SDEC, is not range, is, is not random access. So um, the, the constructor, what we'll actually do is we'll go over the range twice. It will first measure the size, then do the allocation, and then run over it again to copy the characters. Not perfect. So how do we avoid doing that? We give the, the, uh, the character range an, a, an opportunity to implement a more efficient size by just having a size member. And now, in order to ensure that we act, this, the size member is actually being used, we write the explicit loop. We, we just have an empty container, then reserve the container, and then have an explicit loop just copying the, uh, the characters into the container. Okay, that's a, a bit better. Now, um, we also have append, and an append we, we kind of do in a similar way. We reserve, in this, ki in this case, the size, of the container plus the size of the additional range that we want to append, and then we again have our loop. All good? No, not at all good. Reserve is evil. When you do that, then what happens if you, what happens if you take your container and just happen to add ranges of size one, one by one? Then every time you're going to do a reserve, increment the size by one, copy over, or reallocate one more, copy over the old one. Implement one more, copy over the old one. So this is going to be quadratic in its running time. Certainly not what you want. 
Now, what we did is, as always, we just wrap reserve. We write a proper reserve, um, which in the case that you actually have to change the capacity of your container, increases the size of the container at least by a constant factor. Uh, there are some that advocate the, the, the golden ratio um, as that factor. And if you then replace the dot reserve with the wrapper, then you get decent performance. Hmm. So, are we done? Well, not quite. So, the next bottleneck actually are iterators. Why is that? Let's look at how the, the, the concat is very frequent, right? There's kind of a bread and butter to, to um, put things together. And how do iterators of a concat look like? If you have a concat, multiple components in your concat, then the iterator may be any one of the iterators that are contained in your concat. So your iterator of the concat is a variant, really, of the iterator types of all the components you have. Now, each time you're doing an operation on the iterator, you have to branch on the current, con uh, current component that you are in. So if you are, for example, here, I, I showed it for, for the uh, increment. If you have the increment and you are at the component one, you have an iterator of type one, then you increment that iterator of type one, which may be very different code from iterate, uh, incrementing the iterator of type two. And then you have to check whether you reach the end of type one. And if, if you did, then you just switch over to your component two. And for the component two, you can do a blind increment if someone overruns the end iterator of your concat, that's their own fault. Okay, uh, with SDAG actually we have similar problems because SDAG also will have some internal state of which character, which digit is currently producing. And um, if you have to restore that state each and every time you're, you're accessing your iterator, that's gonna be also cost you performance. What's the fundamental problem here? Fundamental problem is that C++ iterators do external iteration. What does that mean? Well, it basically means the consumer of the, of the data runs in a single contiguous code path at the bottom of your stack. And every time he's needing some, some new character, he's just gonna call into the iterator and get a character. Now, this is great for the consumer. So the consumer, when you are at the bottom of the stack, you have a contiguous code path. You never need to restore any state. You can store anything to your liking on the local stack. The stack's not gonna go away. Um, so you get good performance. And at the end, they're also easier to write because this is kind of the way we think. We think in a linear fashion. So they're easy to write. Now the producer has a much harder time because they only have a single entry point. They only have the operator star and they have to restore their state every time as we've seen with the concat. They're harder to write because you have to kind of keep, keep the book, uh, do the bookkeeping. And you get worse performance because you need, always need to restore the state. That was the branching that we see, saw on the concat. Hmm, what are the alternatives? Well, if there's an external iteration, then there's also an internal iteration. Internal iteration just takes the whole thing and turns it upside down. So now you have a producer running at the bottom of the stack and calling into the consumer whenever a character is ready. And then the producer has all the advantages of being on the top of the stack. It's, it's fast, it's easy to write. The consumer now has a trouble. But how much trouble does it really have? I mean, we are talking about an end place back here. We are, we are formatting strings. So the consumer is not very complex. The producer is a whole lot more complex and you would like it to be really at the, at the bottom of the stack. Now, it turns out that many of the range algorithms that are in a normal range library can actually be expressed for, intern or for internal iteration. Uh, you can't do a binary search because you don't have iterators, okay? You can't really do a find, but only as long as you insist on returning an iterator. In our library, you can actually mark it up and say, oh, I only need the value. If you only need the value, you're okay, right? You can do this on, with internal iteration. Um, for each just works. Accumulate just works, all of, any of, none of works. I would say probably in our code in, in ThinkCell, only a very small number of, 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 of ranges are actually done in terms of iterators. Most are, are internal iteration by now. The views also work. So you can actually do this filtering, this lazy filtering that I described. 
can, you can actually do it more efficiently with internal iteration than you can do it with iterators. Um, the, the transform is also is possible. Transform is basically you don't filter the elements of your underlying range, but you, you pump them through a function and you, you, you return the result. So that can also be trivially implemented with internal iteration. So what are we gonna do? Well, we want to extend the range concept so it actually supports internal iteration. All right, um, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to kind of come up with a syntax. And what we did, what we picked, is the function call operator. Now, the disadvantage of using the function call operator is that a range in C20, the SIT span, already has the function call operator defined. It's the same as the square bracket operator, but still, we would have to schema it out. This is not the kind of function call operator that we need. The big advantage of using the function call operator is that any lambda that takes a sync becomes a range, and you can use it together with your range algorithms. So if you look at the for each here, um, the range is just a lambda, it takes a sync, and just passes one and two into the sync. It's a range of one and two. The visitor just takes that number and somehow consumes it. The for each doesn't do a whole lot. It just takes the second lambda and sticks it into the first lambda. That's all it does. Um, you can't do it directly though, because the for each has to basically check whether this is a range that supports internal iteration. And if it doesn't support internal iteration, you have to do the fallback to iterators. And this is, the, this is what for each does. Okay, now, does it help? Well, it helps a lot for a concat. Because suddenly, um, the, the implementation for internal iteration is just, you have your tuple of ranges, your, your, your components, you go over each one of them, and our for each also takes tuples, so you can write that. Um, and then for each of them, you just call for each. So it is very, very close to what you would do if you iterate with a for each over every one of the components. You would just call for each on every one of them. Basically, you have no overhead. How do we use that now to append things to containers? Well, um, we are going to say we have an additional customization point appender, and the append is just a for each on that appender. You just pass this appender that appends to a container to the for each. This is how the appender looks like. It's either some custom defined container that the container can pick, or for the standard containers, we have a default implementation which just does and plays back. Easy enough. Hmm. Our reserve fell a little bit in between the cracks. I kind of forgot about the reserve. How do you do the reserve? Um, for reserve to be done properly, you basically need access to the whole range because you want to ask the range what's your size. So we put in a new customization point, we call it chunk, which essentially says if you have something, if you don't have, if you, you can tell your appender, I don't have a single, single element, but instead I have something bigger. I have a range. That may be the whole range, may only be a part of the range, that would be fine as well, but I have something bigger. And the, this chunk implementation of the reserving appender, which derived from the appender, so it has the regular operator, the function call operator, to deal with elements, the, and the chunk just takes the whole range, then runs the, the reserve, and then just for each is as before, it just recursively calls for each, but actually slices off the reserving. So if you have this huge tree of, of concats, then what would happen is at the first time when you actually can determine the size, you would do the reserve, and then you pass down that tree an, an uh, appender that doesn't do any reserve anymore. It will just use place back because you've done your reserve already. The place back will just work. You may think, well, this chunk thing sounds a bit like, well, they've just done something that serves their single purpose of, of reserving. Not quite. Um, if you want to, for example, append to a file, it's quite, you, you, the, 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 the operating system function usually needs contiguous memory. You need to give it some chunk of memory to write, write into the file, and then you can do it all at once. Now, you can do that here um, with the, the chunk, um, uh, the chunk customization point, 
Um, if you give it a, param a split span parameter, basically a memory block parameter, so for each it's going to check, does that compile? Can I call the chunk with that piece of, of memory, say a vector? And he said, yep, I can convert the vector into a span, so, so I, I can do that. So then the, the, the basically the chunk takes over and writes the whole block at once. But if you discover, well, I have a list and I can't do the conversion, then I just call it element by element. Now, here's actually, um, of course, after I've done all these things, I wanted to know um, how much performance does that actually cost? Because we built this huge infrastructure or big infrastructure. Um, and the question is, how much is that over handwritten code? How much is that over the perfect, simplest possible, most performing formatter? So I built a special buffer that is just plain old memory, 10, 24 bytes. And um, there is a handwritten kind of repeat function with which I will do the following formatting task. I will do 10 times A, 10 times B, 10 times C, and I just marked it up so that the compiler doesn't inline everything and, and just collapses into a constant string. Um, but picking such a very simple task is best to expose any overhead that's in the system because the actual formatter doesn't have much to do. Any, any time we spend extra is, 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 is amplified by the fact that we don't do actual work. We do something very simple in, in the format itself. So that's basically our straw man, that's our benchmark. Um, and against that, we're gonna have the buffer, in, in, in addition to the, in, in the buffer, we have an appender implementation that just appends to the end of the buffer. Again, there is no end check here. It just writes raw strings to the end of the buffer just to expose whatever inefficiencies there are in, uh, in the, the actual framework. So, and then the repeat is, is how we, would, we now would write the repeat with, a, with our proper library. So you do an append to the buffer and then use the repeat n uh, in, in a variadic way. So what did we get? Um, the repeat n, if it's iterator based, is about 50% slower than our benchmark implementation if we use iterator. Now, if we use internal iteration, we end up with something that is just 15% slower than the perfect formatting, which I think is pretty good. Um, it's, it's nice and high level what we're writing, and uh, you, you don't really pay much of it, uh, for it. And, and again, this is the worst case, because we are not really actually doing actual work. Um, you, would have, you would see a smaller difference if you, if you say, convert numbers to, to a string. I did another test, um, which is, I built a toy basic string implementation. It just has stray, uh, three pointers, begin, end, and the end of capacity. Um, and again, I would write, I write the, the trivial formatting task. 10 times A, 10 times B, 10 times C. So that's, that's what we have. And for the first try, um, the basic string appender is going to be our std appender, our standard appender. So it does, in the operator parentheses, it does end place back and it has the reserving appender that does the reserve. So in this case, I'm actually measuring, I'm including the, the, the time that for the, uh, for the memory allocation. Question is, can I do better than this? Can I do better than a combination of first doing a reserve and then doing end place back? The answer is yes, I can. Because I know that after the reserving, I don't need to do the end check. The end place back checks each and every time whether it reached the end of the buffer. It doesn't need to. We reserved already. We know that this is going to fit. You can just write to your heart's content to the end of the buffer and you can be sure that you're not going to overrun. So that is our, our improvement. How much do we get? Remember the string was only 30 characters. Not very long and we had the heap allocation in there. I don't know how fast heap allocation is. That was done on a Windows machine. So that's how fast the heap allocation was as it is on the Windows machine. Um, but still, with Visual Studio latest version, um, actually saves 20% of the time to not check for the end. So it, it's done in a library. I mean, you get it for free. It's, it, it's fine. The only problem is that the basic string and the vector, uh, they, they don't really expose the internal buffer. So you would need to have your own basic string vector implementation. We don't have it yet, but probably at some point we will have uh, that in the library. Now, 
there are other things you can actually do. And I, this is my one before last slide. Um, if not all the snippets implement size, we currently fall back to appending them in, in there with, without doing any reserve, which is not really necessary. Maybe some of the components know their size, and only one component doesn't. So to, in order to avoid having to reallocate multiple times, I could just say, well, just I know already I will need at least that much, so let's allocate that. And then we'll need to see how much that odd man out will require that, that whose size I don't know. And um, you could do that with a new customization point. You could just introduce a min size. And the min size is never wrong to return zero, so you always have the safe fallback. Um, and the min size of the concat, of course, is just the sum of the min sizes of the components. You can do similar things with um, uh, file buffers. So if you replace the file buffer in the std file and, and basically do your own buffer management, um, you could check when you're getting something, you could check its size to, to write into the file. You could check the size and see, is my AO buffer still large enough to hold that, that string? And if it's large enough, you again can write without checking for end. If it's bigger, you can decide. You can either flush the buffer so you have a fresh buffer that's then big enough, or you can say, okay, I'm going to do the end check, and when I'm reaching the end, then I I'm, then I'm have to do the flushing. Um, there may also be room for yet another customization point. You could have max size um, that basically overestimates how much size you need. Um, if someone can't tell for sure, they will overestimate, like, like an integer 32-bit uh, will fit into whatever, um, nine uh, unsigned into nine characters, so you return nine, and then you're, you can be sure that even if you're overestimating it fits, okay, then I don't need an end check, just write it all down. Okay, so that was it. Um, what I want to convince you is, uh, of is that you should use the range syntax to do text formatting, and it's really practical to do so. Um, for if, in order to get good performance, you need a few more customization points. In particular, the range library should support internal iteration. That's something that I think is is really good idea in general because you really get performance, and also in other situations, um, you need an appender. Okay, and you need that special uh, chunk customization point to inspect the whole range or a larger part of a range at once. But if you do all that, then the performance is competitive with handwritten code, and I guess that's, that's what we all want. That's why we are programming C++. The ThingCell library uh, is available on GitHub, and we also now put it under a boost license, so it can be used actually um, in commercial projects. Um, if you try it out, uh, find anything wrong with it, let me know. Um, and then we'll look into it. And um, if you want to help building the library, then of course uh, go to our website and uh, there's always a developer application possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, I think. No, we didn't. Um, so I think um, there are probably other... Oh, okay, repeat the question. Uh, yeah, so did we write all our formatting algorithms ourselves? No, um, this just wasn't our focus. Uh, there are probably better people writing formatting algorithms. Um, and I also didn't pick the TCS deck as a benchmark for exactly that purpose, because you would really possibly have... I've, I've never programmed one, but I looked briefly at, at the, uh, the curly braces format code and it, there are tricks to be played with how to quickly um, uh, generate like format integers. And yeah, you can, you can put that in. Um, in general, I mean, th this, is, this talk is less about imposing a particular you know, way of, of algorithms or anything. It's just like it's nice to have a framework in which you can put all these things into um, that you need. Yeah? What version of C++ um, so we are with the with the library. Yes, uh, which versions of the uh, C++ do we require? Um, pretty much the latest one. 
So um, with, with the library, as I said, um, it kind of a guiding principle is that we always evolve the code and the library together. So you're not really shy of changing the library. Um, and that leads to the library basically requiring whatever the latest version is. So we are currently on C++ 15.8, which is uh, what, what they put out in Visual Studio, and the latest um, Xcode. These are the things that we actually test on there because we have Mac and, and Windows as targets. Um, it uh, it it does yes. Um, it still includes small parts. Ah, does it use Boost as a requirement? Um, yes, it does still include parts of Boost. Um, but um, we we are reducing that amount more and more, um, especially with respect to to traits like like uh, the value type of a range, for example. Um, there, I, I go more and more in. Don't define, don't require an if def, a type def in your in your container, for example. Don't define your value type explicitly. Instead, make it a decayed version of the of the begin the the, the, the reference type essentially the star begin. Um, and if, if that's wrong somehow, then then we have a custom decay where we basically do general decaying. So so bit by bit we kind of kind of munch away on that on that boost part uh, that that we really have been doing for twelve years or fifteen or whatever. I'm afraid neither. Um, so my my experience with the standard um, is, and 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 I have all respect for the people who are who are doing. Oh well, yeah. Are we are we going to put this into the standard library, or are we switching to the standard library, which is probably going to be Eric Niebler's library when it's available, when it's finally in the standard? Um, and the answer is neither. Um, so. I, as much as I would like to put this into the standard library, um, I know that putting something into the standard library or writing a library is about a quarter of the, the effort, and putting it into the standard is three quarters of the effort, or maybe it's 1090 or something. I mean, it, the most of the work is being gonna, gonna be to, to standardize it. Um, that's, that's number one, so it's, it's a political process, no question. Um, number two, we really, I really like um, evolving that library. It, I would hate to be stuck with something where I'm, I'm, I'm now bound to it because I have put it into the standard paper. And I think the library is good, and I think it is good because we were able to evolve it. It kind of, I understand that this is not perfect for if people want to use it uh, in, in their project, then they kind of have to fork it and, and update or not. Mm -hmm. But it's primarily it's an in-house thing um, that that we really really use, and and I I don't want to be stuck with something that I don't no longer believe in because it has already found its way through the standard committee. Um, I, so how does it how does it work with um, breaking, and how does it work with channels? The, I, hmm? Oh, with, with chunk. Um, good question. First of all, the breaking. Um, so in, in general, breaking. This is something I completely omitted um, because I, well, I was talking about text formatting, you don't need to break. Um, there is the, 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 um, the convention that we are always returning um, an enum break or continue from everything where we want to break out of. And we have kind of a bit of metaprogramming that basically anything that returns a void does not break. It's basically always continue. But if you want to break in all situations, like take the first element, for example, you can also return an integral constant of break. So you can turn the break and the, the enum into an integral constant, return it, then it'll always break. Or usually you will then re just return the enum break or continue, and it controls whether you want to continue the iteration or not. And with chunk, it actually works the same way. There's, there's nothing really special about, about chunk. I mean, whether the, the appender does something that is unnecessary because someone internally breaked, well, that's kind of his business. He has to understand what he is then doing. So if you allocate memory a lot, and later on you decide to break, well, you call this for each with that functor yourself. 
So whatever it does is kind of your responsibility when you do it inside Chunk. So, so the Chunk as well as the, um, the, uh, the, 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 op the function call operator could return break or continue. And that's where you control how to, uh, uh, whether to break. In, in, a, in a very early, very naive implementation, we threw an exception, but that's, in an ideal world, I find out this is the semantics that you want, but of course in practicality, it's way too slow. So we return in any way. No, I haven't. Uh, have you done any measurements of code size? I must say, in, in brief, no. Um, I, yeah, I think that's complete. Um, are you aware of any other uh, format of my brain that can be decoded on the HTML code? Well, I mean, um, am I aware of any any other formatting libraries that do the deferred evaluation? If you mean by deferred evaluation, um, do kind of the nesting, I believe the answer is no, at least not out of the box. Um, but I mean, of course, they all do quite extensive const expert pre optimization. So I, there is no question. I, I know that the that the, um, the 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 curly braces format library um, does pre calculates the size, for example. So I'm assuming that for anything for anything flat, kind of the same thing is going on. You just calculate the size and then. Really, the contribution here is that you can do this in a framework. You don't have to do that in a, in a special case function that just does text formatting. It's something that you probably want in general in your range library. Okay. Uh, do you view this as complementary or competing with the curly braces format library you discussed? Um, I mean, for us, is it is it complementary or competing with a form, curly braces format library? Um, for us in-house, it's clearly competing. We are not going to use the curly braces format library. Um, is the curly braces format library bad? No, it's probably a whole lot better than what we had before. I mean, don't use IO streams. Um, so no hard feelings, but no, I mean, in-house, we will, we, will uh, we, will, we will do it this way. In particular, because um, we are only using these format strings, or we frequently use the format strings when we do translation. Uh, there's a whole framework in the program that extracts the strings and, and, and delivers out the, the, tra uh, the translation as, as constant strings with like a, a, a const expert hashing going on so that you basically have functions where you pull the right translation out. Um, and and there you don't want that that format string to be to be any smart. The, the format string is also written in a way that it doesn't do anything crazy if things if, if people mess it up. So if, I mean it can always very well happen that you um, you don't validate everything that you're getting from the translators. Some we have very quick release cycles, so you get something on the translator, put it in there, and then you discover, oops, um, my my strings messed up, and and that that the damage done should be very limited. Okay. Oh, there's more. Uh, how do you do locale dependent uh, formatting? How, you do, how do you do locale dependent formatting? Um, the, the lesson that we, or that, that, that we learned from, from, um, uh, from our code, that's, that's all I can say, is you have to decide which, lo this general idea you set a locale, and this is your locale, and this is great, now we have it set it for, for forever, and we don't have to think about it anymore, is, is flawed. Um, because a program is going to generate text presented to the user. There you have an idea of a, of a, of a language, certainly, uh, that you set once from some source. Um, you, but you also generate other strings. You generate strings for JSON, for XML, uh, for, for, uh, for sending stuff to whatever in text form somewhere. And there you mo may want a different locale. You may want a different, uh, um, uh, a different uh, say, convention for comma and, and, and period. Um, so we actually supply that each and every time. We don't have any defaults built into the library. We, we would have defaults if that would be really ugly. I mean, if that would, would bother us like hell, then, then we wouldn't do that. But if you look at the actual use cases, and that's, that's kind of the advantage of having so much a million lines of production code, um, you really want to think about it each and every time. And, and we've actually, I, I've seen scenarios where just people have done it wrong. They, they, 
they just said, okay, we're going to do something default, like it's everywhere, um, and then they send something with XML, but they have a comma in there because they happen to be in Germany. Um, so that's why I'm kind of forcing people to decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. Same with, uh, with dates, right? I mean, if you, if you format a date, you really have to distinguish between formatting this for someone where you, you know that he is in a particular, um, in a, in a particular country, and you may know this in a varying degree, like when you have a, you, you come from, the, in your, you are on a desktop application, then you can be pretty sure that he understands what the explorer does, the file explorer. The file explorer supports a format, you can pick that format, that's pretty safe, he's understanding that. But if you say you have an applicant for a developer position, right, and you're kind of guessing like where he comes from uh, based on his IP address, then you may not want to give him a date for an interview um, in, in like a month, day representation. That, that, that's, that's just, nah, you may be wrong there. So you really have to think about what you, what you want in terms of, of, it's not just like as simple as setting a locale and then, and then run with it, my experience. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And... Uh, yeah, have a great rest of the conference.